Uh, welcome to the NETS WebSocket introduction. My name is Alberto Ricard. I am the main contributor and maintainer for the NETS JavaScript client. Uh, with me, I actually have uh, Ivan Koslovi, and he's the main uh, one of the maintainers for the NETS server, as well as the Go and C clients. He's also the main engineer behind NETS streaming server. So WebSocket is finally here. I started this project way back in May of 2018, and we have been waiting to release it because right from the get-go, we knew that we wanted to support WebSockets directly on the server. WebSockets on the server finally made it to the schedule, and here we are. So NAS in the browser changes everything, or at least I'd like to think so. We're used to thinking of NAS for implementing services and other business logic, but we're always doing so in the back end. With NAS on the browser, we can rethink how we develop some of these front-end applications and onboard some of the concepts that we do so naturally on the back end, on the front end as well. So NAS in the browser is about the browser becoming an active participant. The browser can request any data that it needs. It can respond to any information that other services need. It can update based on messages that it receives. It can publish information that other services may find useful. And with WebSockets, we can do all of this without requiring anything between the browser and the NAT server. This is actually great because what it means is we can do away with a lot of the things that we do with Ajax, and we can do a lot of this without polling, right? It also means that we can use a single technology for both the back end and the front end, and I think that's great. So it all starts with a subject, uh, but on HTTP, everything starts with a URL. So if we actually had uh, a web application, we would have, let's say that we wanted to get a list of users that are currently active in our application. We would have some server that would have an endpoint where we could actually query for all the users that are there. As users come in and go out, they would post to the same server to a different URL and basically say, hey, user A came in, user B exited. In that, everything actually revolves around the subject. So we listen for messages. And sometimes these messages actually carry a reply subject and um, services that are configured to do so will respond. And we can listen to other things that are actually happening around. So other things can actually tell us that something happened and we can react. So we can do something or react to the information that we see uh, without actually looking for it exactly, right? We simply just start our application, our application starts listening, things happen, and there we are. The, the other benefit is, is that in, in some types of applications, we may actually need to store data on a server so that the browser can actually query that server and extract an idea of what it wants to present. With NAS running in the browser, we can actually request that information from all the services themselves. So instead of actually storing state or having uh, any kind of thing that we have to put in between, individual services can simply answer for themselves um, what they're stated. So if we had a dashboard, all of the different components could basically say, hey, I'm here. Um, and whenever their state changes, something could actually say, hey, that changed or I changed, right? Um, without having a specific uh, URL or location bound into where the data is, we don't have to have an assumption of how the backend topology lays out. The response could even be something that actually came from another browser. Now, in typically when you have a, a web service, the HTTP request will actually present a context. And the context is usually a set of cookies and some HTTP headers that then the service can actually examine. And based on that, it knows that you are the one making the call, right? So it knows who's calling. NAS doesn't have headers. And the communication between clients is typically anonymous. But NATS does have a very good uh, story around security and how to isolate unauthorized clients. So in a web application, we can simply have go through the regular authentication mechanism, whatever you decide that to be. And based on that, we can generate an authorization. The authorization will take the form of a JWT. The JWT that is given to the client can encode 
what application that client belongs to. And it also can restrict what the client can or not do. When the client connects to the application is simply, or to the NAT server rather, uh, the NAT server will verify the JWT and enforce what it's specifying. So what's in this JWT? So the JWT is normally issued by some entity. In this case, it's actually issued by an, an, an application, an account, right? And it uniquely identifies one of the user that is accessing the application. It also determines the subject that the user may actually uh, uh, publish and the subjects that the user may actually listen to. So one way that we can deal with relating back to the application, who is the user making the, the request is that the namespace for the subjects could actually be clamped to the subject that the, uh, the user can actually publish or subscribe to. So in this case, if you're looking at the JWT, there's a field here where it says, you know, this user can publish to user.alberto.senadia.com.star. That means that I can only publish to that subject. Uh, it actually is not the only one. I have another one over here, uh, the underscore inbox.user.star and user.who. Uh, the first one here, user.who, is how the application can actually request to find out other users that may be out there. The inbox user.star is how those uh, services that are actually responding can answer back to, to, to my uh, browser instance. And finally here, this is uh, with user alberto at cineta.com, I can specify uh, messages that I actually wanna give about my life cycle. So for example, my, my user may say, hey, I'm entering or I'm exiting, right? Similarly, on the other side, it actually specifies the things that I can subscribe to. And thus we give the server the ability to constrain what the client can and cannot do on the server side. So this system ends up being more flexible. NAS is always connected. And because of that, the applications or dynamic applications can be more responsive. There's no longer the need to actually connect, request, wait, repeat, and that kind of loop that most web applications end up having. Services just simply connect and they uh, express their interest in receiving information. And whenever that information appears, they can update themselves to show that, right? If they need something, they can make a request services can answer, the, the answer may come from one or more services. So they could actually do aggregation, right? And all of that happens right within the browser, right? The servers, the service is no longer bound to a specific URL, or in this case, not even the backend, because you could implement part of the service to be running in the browser itself. So whenever, you know, another browser makes a request, other browsers may be able to participate and say, hey, I'm here, and some typical tab of applications like, um, for example, um, uh, Slack and things like that, do things like this, right? So, so this is actually great. In terms of uh, deployments and things like that, if, if I'm thinking in terms of NAT services, there I have more flexibility. I don't necessarily specify what the layout of my topology is, and I can change it. As long as I have a service that responds to what I need, everything is great. If I need to scale it, my DevOps guy just has to add more, and everything just works, right? NATS is a more flexible and agile ecosystem. So going back or secretly back into what it means to have WebSockets, what does this mean? Well, the code actually looks like, surprisingly, NATS. So here we have a sample. If you're familiar with the JavaScript clients, this won't be too uh, dissimilar to what you have seen before. I actually have on, over here uh, uh, an object that defines uh, me, and then I run a function, it connects to a NAT server, and then it provides a JWT that I got from somewhere. And then it sets an option here that says no echo. All that does is basically say that whenever the client publishes a message, that message shouldn't be fed back into a subscription from the same client. So that avoids some of the noise that uh, uh, happens if you publish and then you're listening to messages that you sent yourself. So in web applications, usually we have to be able to handle things that don't work quite right. Um, for example, on NATS, on typical clients on NATS, 
when the client closes, it will automatically try to reconnect. On the WebSocket client, um, maybe this is not the right behavior because it is actually driving something from within the web app. And in many cases, the easiest way to deal with the logic is just simply to just reload the page, right? That will basically reinitialize the connection and, and then messages can flow through, right? So in, in this sample that I have here, we have a client that actually does a connection. It register a, a close listener so that it can reload the page if, if something fails. And then it creates a subscription for user who. What that will allow is it'll allow other clients that publish to that uh, message would allow this particular browser instance to receive that request and actually respond, giving back the user information that it has for itself. The same way the, the client will subscribe to user star entered, where the star will be replaced by the ID of the user, whatever that may be. And then that way, whenever a new browser enters the application, then the, uh, the, the, the this browser that is presenting information will be aware of it and it can render that in some sort of way, right? We also have a way over here that where the client is actually uh, subscribing to exit it so they can know when clients go away and then also update itself. Finally, uh, right uh, before it, it, it actually goes and, and, and just waits passively for input, the client publishes an event saying, hey, I have entered. And what that will do is basically aggregate this browser to other clients that are out there. So now that I've described some of this, one question is, well, what does it look like? And I want you to actually head out here and go to http offdemo.nats-demo.info. And if you can see that, um, um, we, we, you can see what the, uh, um, what the, uh, what the application is. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop presenting or I'm going to stop, uh, where do I, I'm going to click that guy out and I am going to go back here. And are you looking at the wrong screen? Is that what I'm understanding now? No, no, we, we see your uh, website okay. demo page. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So what I want to do right now is I'm, I, I went to this auth demo.nats demo.info. This is actually live. So if you would like to try it, that would be awesome. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign in with Google. Again, we're going to do the process where we're going to provide the web application with some context of who the user is. And that usually means some sort of authentication process. So I'm going to go pick my ID here. And then, boom, there we go. We are in our application. And wh what our application is doing is it's telling us how many live people there are. And if someone, for example, if I start moving my mouse, you see that my picture actually highlights in yellow. But I see other people that are moving their mouses as being highlighted in red. And effectively, we're seeing the full life cycle. You can also see that I have a terminal going on over here. And the terminal is only printing messages that I generate so that we don't show any information about your email and things like that, um, that Google provided when, when you authenticated. But you can see the messages actually flying through. The, also, with this application, there's a back end service that basically figures out the capacity of the room. And based on that capacity, if there's room uh, for, for bots to come in, it actually generates fake users. And these fake users are actually shared between all of us, right? So we see them actually come in and, and go away. So if I log out, and I'm gonna try that right now, you will see that one, my, my picture goes away and its place got taken over by a bot. But I can come back really quickly and then show it again right there. And what's happening, Google? Google coming, there we go, boom, there we go. So that's, that's that. So in um, summary, let me go re continue over here and actually give you another summary of, of what's going on. We have authenticated to Google. We generated a JWT on the server in which we actually inserted constraints on the subjects that the application could generate and, and publish to and subscribe, right? 
we published a request to the network saying who's out there. And then we got from each of the browsers and the service, the users that are there, right? So we discovered other things that are happening in there. And then we um, actually evented the application so that if there was some sort of interaction from the user, which in this case is just simply moving the mouse, we actually represented that somehow. And uh, so that's all we do. And, uh, and then of course, if you click uh, the logout button, it'll actually uh, do an exit and then remove the association between the Google credentials that you provided and the application. So next. So what about the server? I've been talking quite a bit here. Uh, I actually haven't given a chance uh, to Ivan to talk about the things that he has done on the server to support WebSockets. So without further um, information from my side, here comes Ivan. Thanks, Alberto. This is a great demo and we are running already 60 minutes, so I don't want to talk too much. Uh, basically, now this WebSocket support is directly in the, in the server, so you don't need an extra proxy um, you know, sidecar to, to enable your WebSocket client to communicate to the server. The um, enabling WebSocket in the server is as simple as having a new WebSocket block uh, that you can see here in the slide, where we, you need to define a port we need to define a TLS block because we enforce TLS communication. Um, we could have done without, but it was a conscious choice. And that's because um, Alberto mentioned that uh, you know, clients are likely to use bearer tokens. And actually we have a talk later on bearer tokens. And so you don't, you know, you want to make sure that the communication between the client and the server is secure. Um, so that's, that's a, a, an enforcement by the server to, to, to have TLS. We also have some extra um, configuration like allowed origins, which will limit uh, the server will inspect the uh, request uh, origin header to make sure that it's coming from uh, a list of, uh, you know, origin that you specify here. That's optional, you could do without. You can even use the file uh, for local tests where you could have a file uh, colon slash slash, I believe, and that will allow client that run outside of a real web server. And you have a uncheck timeout, which is um, you know ensuring that this, the the actual uncheck, including the TLS uncheck, uh, doesn't take too long. Otherwise, the server will uh, cut off the uh, the client. Um, so the but apart from that, any WebSocket client is will be able to interact with any other type of client, regular NATS client. Um, they are treated in the server the same way that any other client. Uh, the only difference is. When the server reads data from, from the client socket, it will basically remove the WebSocket frames. And when sending, it will uh, add a WebSocket frame to that. Um, we also have a, a small optimization. We've, we've seen by uh, experiment that web um, browser clients tend to perform not too good when, when the server is sending a bunch of, of, of bytes to the, to, the, to the client. So what we did is try to detect if, uh, if a client uh, runs in the browser, and in this case, try to limit the, the add one frames uh, for that. Uh, something also to note that if you experience some performance different um, issues, uh, that not all browser are the same. Uh, for instance, we noticed that Safari is like three times faster than let's say Chrome. Uh, so with the ecosystem of, of browser, you may, you may have different uh, uh, performance, but at the same time, we don't expect a, a page to require that many message segments. So that should not be really an issue. Uh, a quick note and, and I will be done. The, the TLS uh, uncheck is done right away. So unlike normal NATS client that have the protocol of the server sending an info in, in plain text and then switching to a TLS, uh, this is different. This is um, the server is actually running a, a, a small web server uh, that accept the connection and, and does the TLS uncheck right away. So if people use, um, you know, NGINX or whatever in, in between, uh, they will be able to talk TLS right away. Um, so yeah, so that's it. And uh, I think uh, I'll uh, give the, um, back to, to Alberto and uh, I'm done with, with my presentation. Thanks. So thank you very much. This is it. I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions. We have a NAS channel for uh, uh, Net, uh, JavaScript. Uh, we actually, I forget now what it's called. I think it's uh, NAS uh, JS. 
Oh, yeah, and they're just a quick note for the server. Right now, it's in a, in a PR, uh, and uh, we plan to release probably in beta first uh, in the next release, uh, just to make sure that uh, we, uh, you know, if we need to add some options or, or stuff like that to the configuration to not break anything, but it, it should be available. And people can already uh, play with it if you want. It's in the WebSocket branch uh, in the NAT server repo. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Alberto and Ivan. Um, I, I know the ecosystem has been wanting something like this for, for quite um, a long time. And trust me, we, we have been listening and we want that, right? We want NATS to be that pervasive connective technology that um, is kind of like a uh, electric plug. It's everywhere and it just kind of works, including web and mobile like this. But behind the scenes, what's been going on to enable this is all these other pieces from the original designs of NATS 2.0, um, the accounts, the different security models, leaf nodes that allow um, mixed uh, operator and security models within a very large um, NATS system um, to enable this type of thing, all kind of had to fall in place before we could get to a point where we felt comfortable. But we're super excited to be entering into the web and mobile space. Uh, we know we're just uh, beginning, but we think uh, the way we've architected the system and what's actually behind all of the stuff that Alberto and Yvonne were showing um, just adds to the power of the solution. So thanks for everyone's patience for it. I know it's been a long time coming. Uh, people were frustrated with that, um, but we're really excited with what, how it uh, kind of came together. So. There's a quick question, uh, when will it run on NGS? Um, as soon as it actually lands in the server, we'll probably start lighting it up as an experiment for NGS, meaning you can come in and say, can you enable this for my NGS account? Um, but we definitely plan on having that and things like Jetstream as enablement um, services on NGS accounts. So uh, yeah, thank you uh, again, Alberto and Von. Good, good stuff, this is cool.